In this video, we're going to continue our work with probability and look at relative frequency. In all of the videos so far, we've looked at examples that involve theoretical probabilities. Sometimes theoretical probabilities might not be suitable to establish the likelihood of an event happening. Let's take an example of a game of football. Let's say we have Brazil. Brazil are a pretty good football team. If we look at the probability of Brazil winning, the probability of them winning will be equal to one third, theoretically. The probability of them drawing will also be equal to one third. The probability that they will lose will be equal to one third. We know these are all of the possible outcomes and each event is given an equally likely chance of happening. We can't always do this because these are not equally likely to happen. So if Brazil are a very good team, it's highly unlikely that they'll only win a third of their games and they will lose as many as one third of the games. What we do in this case is use something called relative frequency. So we either find the relative frequency, which is the probability, by doing experiments or going on past records. So let's look at an example now. If we said that Brazil had played 100 games and made 190 of them, we could say the relative frequency of them winning a game would be 90 out of 100 or 0 0.9. So these theoretical probabilities can't really be applied in certain situations. Take another example, Usain Bolt running the 100 metres. If there are eight people in the final, the probability of win him winning is one out of eight. The probability of him finishing in second place is one out of eight. Clearly, that's not going to be the case, as on past form, the probability of him winning is going to be a lot more than one eighth. So let's look at an example of experimental probability. What we're going to do is take a fair six-sided dice. So if we take a fair six-sided dice, so just jotting this down, we know that theoretically the probability of a number one will be equal to one over six. All of these are equally likely outcomes. We've got now one over six. We have now the probability of three is gonna be one over six. The probability of four will be equal to one over six. And probability of five will also be one over six. Finally, the probability of a 6 is going to be 1 over 6. So this now is the theoretical probability of each of these outcomes, or the event, for example, the probability of rolling a 1 is 1 6. Let's say I did three trials to check if this was a fair dice. So if I did now three rolls or three trials, and I had now on the first one a number 2, on the second one, I had a number five, and on the third one, I had a number two. We could say from this that the probability of one is going to be zero. The probability of a two is going to be two thirds. The probability of three will be zero. The probability of four is going to be zero. The probability of five will be one third, and the probability of six is going to be zero. Quite clearly, the more trials I do, the more likely this is to become closer to now the uh, theoretical probability. So by carrying out three experiments, this is really poor. So if I picked up this dice now, and I said the probability of rolling at number two on the next go is two thirds, we can see that's pretty poor. What we would see as we went on, and I'll just sketch this up, if we drew a graph, I'm going to take now a graph and we will look at the probability of rolling a number two. So this is now going to be the probability of rolling a number two. We would have the one over six. So this is now the number of rolls. So put this here. So number of rolls and we'll just drop this in. And this now is going to be the probability. So probability of a two. What we'll see initially now is some spikes here and then it will generally, if this is a fair six-sided dice, the more we do, the more it will tend to this line. So we might start off with something that looks a bit like this. We might come down, we might go up, and the more that we do, we would end up getting closer 
and closer so it might do something like that but essentially it would get closer and closer to this line the more trials we did so if we did for example 600 trials we would probably end up now getting around 100 twos because it's got a probability of one six so if we did this now if it was somewhere way up here completely off we could then say that this dice was biased so this is now relative frequency or experimental probability we can write that the relative frequency so just jotting this down so the relative frequency is given so relative frequency is now the number of successful trials so number of successful trials so let's just write this down successful trials divided by the total number of trials so divided by total number of trials so that's nice and straightforward so number of trials so that's what we have that's relative frequency or if you like experimental probability so let's look at a question let's say i uh, play darts so i'm going to play darts and we're going to say the probability that I win is going to be 0 0.8. I can either now, so let's put uh, probability of win rather than probability of 0 0.8. Probability that I win is going to be 0 0.8. A question might ask us based on this, so probability that I win, that looks better. What's the probability that I lose? I can either win or lose. Well, we know from our previous work, the probability of something not happening is 1 minus the probability of it happening. So this would be 0 0.2. So I could say now that this is 0 0.8 or if we like 4 fifths and we could say 1 fifth. Remember we can write probabilities as fractions or decimals. So what we can now do is look at the expected number of games that I might win based on this experiment. Or if you like collecting information from past records. So let's say I played now 40 games. So if I played 40 games, how many would you expect me to win? All we need to do to find the expected number of outcomes, so expected, let's put this here, X, uh, I'll be able to spell that now. Okay, let's get that right, expected, expected. So expected number of outcomes, so expected number of outcomes is simply going to be the probability multiplied by the number of trials. So let's look at this and what this means. So if I played 40 games, how many of them would you expect me to win? All we would need to do is take our probability, which is going to be 4 fifths, and multiply it now by 40. That would be the expected number of games I'd win. I've taken the probability and multiplied it by the number of trials. So if I do this, 40 divided by 5 is 8, times by 4, I would expect to win 32 games. If the probability of me winning uh, a game of tennis is going to be 0 0.1, the probability that I will lose will be 0 0.9. So before, this is done on experimental probability or relative frequency. It's not done by a 50-50 equally likely chance of me winning or losing. Quite clearly, if I was someone like Roger Federer or Rafael Nadal, this would probably be the other way around. So how many games would you expect me to win? If I played 200 games, this is the number of trials, this is the probability, we would simply multiply. So we could do 0 0.1 multiplied by 200, or if you like, you could write it as 1 tenth multiplied by 200. Either way around, I would expect to win 20 games. So this is a slightly different way of looking at probability, but often far better than just saying now the probability of winning as a third, drawing as a third, and losing as a third. These generally are not going to be equally likely outcomes. So let's look at a couple of questions on these. What we're going to do is just work through some basics. So a gardener plants 40 seeds and 32 of them produce healthy plants. In part eight, we're asked to estimate the probability that a seed produces a healthy plant. Well, we can say the probability, and I'll say probability of a healthy one, is going to be 32. We've seen 32 out of 40 are going to be healthy plants. So we could simplify this. Uh, we could divide both those by 8. So we could say 4 fifths, or if you want, 0 0.8. So in part B, if 120 seeds were planted, how many healthy plants can the gardener expect to obtain? 
So all we need to do is multiply the probability by the number of trials, or you could do your 0 0.8. From here, now we would have 120 divided by five is going to give me 24. Four times by 24 is going to give me 96. So we would expect 96 healthy plants. If you want, you can do that on a calculator. So if you do 0 0.8 multiplied by 120, that's going to give us a 96. Then if we were asked how many we'd be, uh, expect to be unhealthy, it's just going to be 120 minus that. Or alternatively, one fifth of them are going to be unhealthy. And that would give us a 24. So this is the expected number of outcomes. Okay, let's look at another one. Six children play regularly in a chess club. The number of games that each child has won is recorded in the table below. So you've got the players, Timothy, Andrew, Daniela, Rachel, Charles and Maria. Games won, games lost. In part A it says use this data to find the probability that each child wins a match. Let's just be a little careful here. Games won, games lost. So we've got 4 and 10. That's a total of 14. So we can see now the probability that Timothy wins a game is going to be 4 out of 14. Don't fall into the trap of doing 4 out of 10. 7 and 3 is 10, so we've got 7 over 10. We've got now 3 of, over 12, 3 over 12. On the next one, we've got 4 out of 20. On this one right here, we've got 6 out of 18. And then finally, we've got 12 out of 18. We can, of course, simplify these or we could write them as decimals. Often it's easier to compare now these as decimals. So for example, with this one, we could simplify this. We could write this as two over seven. This one would be seven tenths. This one would be one quarter. This one would be one fifth. This one would be one third. Uh, and this one, let's put 12 over 18 rather than 12 over eight. And this one is going to be two-thirds. So if we wanted to write these as decimals, we could do. This one is going to be 0 0.6 recurring. This is going to be 0 0.3 recurring. This one is going to be 0 0.2. This is going to be 0 0.25. This one is going to be 0 0.7. And then finally, two sevenths. Let's do that one. Let's do two sevenths. And two divided by seven is going to give me 0 0.286 so 0 0.286 0 0.286 and I've done that to uh, three decimal places I suppose you could uh, you don't need that level of accuracy so from here let's look at what we've got it says use the data to find the probability that each child wins a match well that's it as a fraction and that is it what we're looking at now is for successful outcomes the number of successful outcomes four of 14 7 of 10, 3 of 12, 4 of 20, 6 of 18, and 12 of 18. So it now says which child is the best player. What we're looking for is the highest value right here. So Andrew is 0 0.7, Maria is 0 0.6 recurring, so we can say that Andrew is the best player. Now that's, that's based on him only playing 10 games. You could argue that if he played another 10, that might go up or it might go down. But based on the information we've got, Andrew is the most successful player. Which child is the worst player? Well, it's the one with the lowest, and that looks to be Rachel just here. So the probability that Rachel wins any given match, let's put her on, is going to be 0 0.2. In fact, we won't cover that up because we might have to use that. So putting this on, so let's put that there. So 0 0.2, that's the lowest probability. If Charles played Timothy, who do you think would be most likely to win? So if we look, we've got Charles here. So let's just put Charles on. That's Charles, 0 0.3 recurring. And that is Timothy, 0 0.286. We could say Charles is more likely to win as the probability of him winning a match is going to be higher. We could, of course, extend some of these questions. We could, for example, say now, um, let's go for uh, one of the others. We'll just choose 
we'll choose a question here. Let's say we were now asked uh, if Maria played, let's go for, if Maria pay, played, what, well, let's go for 275 games. So if she played 200, and we'll swap that over, uh, 275 games, how many would you expect her to win? So this is Maria, she's going to play, and I'll just jot this down, Maria, we've got 275 games. All we would do is take the probability and multiply it by the 275. So we can see now two thirds multiplied by the 275, and we can do this on a calculator. So two thirds, so two thirds. This is simply saying she's going to win two thirds of the game, the game she plays, assuming that uh, this holds true. So 183, we'll say approximately now 183 games. That's how many we would expect her to win. Remember, these probabilities can fluctuate. So it might be the case that Andrew got lucky in the first 10 games and he doesn't win another one. The more trials we do, the more the, the accuracy, the higher the level of accuracy of the probability we assign to any of these particular events happening. So the event of Andrew winning a game is currently 0 0.7 but that might change if we did 100, 200, 300 different trials. And in this case, two, 300 games. So there we go. Looking at the difference between theoretical and experimental probability. We can use experimental probability if we want to test if something is biased. So for example, if we took a dice and we wanted to test if it was biased, if we did enough trials, we could probably establish that rather than just taking for granted that we have equally likely outcomes, the probability that one is one six, the probability of two is one six, and so on and so forth.